today I wanted to share a bit of uh, the way that I work with, um, with you guys. Um, so the talk today is uh, Considering Colour, um, the Branded Environment. <clears throat> As Alina said to you, uh, earlier on this year, I joined forces with an ex-colleague of mine, um, Carolina Calzada. Um, we, we've come together, really, because I come from, uh, my expertise is in colour development through um, colour psychology, colour trend and colour science, mixing those together. Carolina's specialism is very much in the business of colour, so she understands very clearly how you market your business through colour. Um, and the, I mean, this is an amazing facility, but uh, there's very few of these around the world. So most <coughs> designers working in industry, unfortunately, don't have this sort of access. They don't necessarily work, understand the way that uh, colour agencies work. They may be given a book and then get on with it. So what we want to do is kind of share our knowledge uh, with industry and uh, really kind of give something, give something back to it. So we're going to be doing that, uh, we're yet to launch, but we're going to be doing that through um, a series of masterclasses, info sessions, and um, we do a lot of curation. We've recently uh, done the colour for London Design Fair, um, that was a few weeks ago. Um, where we help design the palette for the fair and then through one of our clients, Craig and Rose a Paint Company, we um, designed a project space for them that was about around colour memory and uh, we, we engaged like three artist designers to explore their um, feelings of colour memory through this colour palette. So it, it was a really interesting exercise. <clears throat> But today, I want to talk to you about uh, how we work in colour. So for quite some time now, I've been uh, fascinated with uh, developing colour stories um, from the brand perspective. So I think originally it was seen as a little bit weird as I'm coming from a trend agency and trend is kind of all about what's happening around you. But um, you see business after business like chasing new customers and what they end up doing is watering down who they are so much that that message gets completely lost and in turn the consumer loses interest. Trend is still a really important aspect of colour design. I think the days of the trend forecaster who talks down to the world and I, I know what's happening in the world, you must all use this colour. I think those days are gone. I think that um, colour of the year is no longer a, a dictation of you must use, this is the colour you're going to use. It's become more of a conversation piece to have with people. So it is really important for businesses to understand the social context that they're working within, but it shouldn't be what motivates them. The brand should be internally motivated. Colour is uh, visual and visceral. Um, we're now at a stage uh, where colour should not just be, this is my logo and this is the brand, this is the product that I make. What consumers are actually looking for is that experience of your brand all the way through every touch point, every experience that they have with you. So uh, it's about not just colour, but texture, scent, are all really important. We connect emotionally with uh, colour in the same way we connect emotionally with a brand. Uh, the consumer's decision-making process is no longer we go into a shop and we buy this. It's a multi-channel experience. <clears throat> so you'll see Instagram captures these moments like bang, 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 bang. But your touch point with your consumer goes right the way through your print, your VR, AR. Uh, through your design and product itself, even down to the lighting that's in the cafeteria of your staff. All of this should come back to your brand values. So I'm sure you can appreciate that colour is super important. It's an amazing tool in communication because of its quality of being a visual aesthetic and creating that, visual, that visceral experience. 
few statistics, because everybody loves a statistic. Uh, so 84.7% of consumers say that colour is the main reason for purchase. So quite often it's the final decision maker as well. You've been through all the technical uh, bump, you know exactly what type of product, and then your final decision is, okay, so what colour do we buy? Between 62 and 90% of all first interactions with a brand, product, person, environment is based on colour. 80% of people think that colour increases brand uh, recognition and uh, it's been shown that color is the first attribute that our brain processes when we interact with uh, that brand so this happens in millions of nanoseconds I can't I can't remember the exact amount um, but yeah we'll, we'll have a little bit more of a look at that afterwards so how do we speak color that's a really important aspect um, I think in the past, uh, various colour disciplines have very much kept themselves to themselves, maybe been a little bit rude about each other. I think I've heard uh, a few in the applied colour psychology say, oh, those trend lot, they're just a bunch of kids playing with paper, they've got no idea what they're doing. Um, but then, when they're working on purely a colour psychology uh, basis, you see that the strategies then actually lack the understanding of the social context and sometimes miss some of the aesthetic value that is really important to us. So really, <coughs> sorry, I've got a bit of a frog in my throat. So really, I think with the, to really complete like a future-proof colour language for your brand right through into your uh, packaging and product, you need to incorporate all three. So, the applied colour psychology, this is the DNA, the core, the essence of who you are. So you build this framework that you have these parameters that you can kind of work within. Colour symbolism, um, you want your message to say the same across any language. So we will have cultural differences and slightly different ways that we message. If you actually look down to the colour design itself, does the colour that you're proposing agree with the consumer's uh, perception of the product category? So, for example, one colour might work fabulously in the plastic bottles that Jessica's just um, been showing us, but then does that, go, that same colour then translate into a luxury uh, car product? You have to consider those elements of it. And then colour trend firmly places the social context of you. So um, a few years ago, I did a bit of research to uh, try and understand in my own mind how colour may change when something major happens in the world. So I had to look at all the images that I could find for um, fashion and interiors for the season preceding the 2008 global crash. Um, I looked at <clears throat> pretty much everything. I know that all the colours will be out there all the time, but this is the way that we're presenting ourselves, so it gives you kind of a, an indication of how people are feeling. I then looked at exactly the same season, same shows, same designers, for the season after the crash. And what you saw was actually really interesting. So I, I had hundreds and hundreds of images, but when you looked at it as an overall, Pre-crash, you saw this explosion of colour. It was confident, it was saturated, it was vibrant. Post-crash, all the colours are still there, but what you see is the saturation levels have come right down. It's altogether much more muted, much more um, considered, uh, restrained, probably a little less confident. In uh, 1997, I think, uh, <coughs> Jennifer Aker um, built a framework, uh, the brand personality. She's a Stanford professor. Um, and in that, she looked at what it was uh, that made up a brand. And she identified five dimensions. So we've got sincerity, excitement, competence, sophistication, and ruggedness. Each of these dimensions has four facets 
that uh, will further break it down. So you can kind of pretty much put any brand into these areas. What is really interesting then is 2011, a long term Lebrec and Mill, who take Acres uh, brand um, dimensions and through a series of empirical uh, research, they um, find a link between uh, colour and, um, and these personalities. And so it was really interesting, I thought, that uh, you have sincerity. So for the consumers, he was having a, they were having an agreement that white and pink were the colours that kind of came to mind. For excitement, uh, it was red. Competence, blue. Blue is obviously the colour that's mostly used in brand logos around the world. Sophistication, black and purple. And then, interestingly enough, they start bringing in negatives. So if you see orange, that absolutely says it's not sophisticated to that customer. Ruggedness, brown, that kind of earthy, uh, earthiness. And then again, a negative for... Oh, I've, oh thanks, I've got that probably uh, classier if I put it in a cup um, and then for brown you get the negative for pink and purple <clears throat> now what Lebrecht and Milne did very interesting um, but they're really looking at a hue what happens that you know there's millions of blues what happens when we look at other ones do they all keep saying the same thing to us so I'm going to show you three blues. I've deliberately pulled back the navigation so that you can concentrate on these three blues. Um, and are they, are they giving you the same feeling? Do they all look competent to you? Um, they're three well-known brands. Shout out if anybody knows any of them straight away. Which one? Twitter? No? No. Which one? Nivea? No. They're not that well known then. <laughs> Thought they were so well known. Okay, let's try again. I'm going to start putting some of the uh, brand values in for you. Um, okay, so uh, I've selected a, a one from each. So I've got innovation, integrity, and luxury. Which one would you think would be the most innovative? Middle? This innovation in the middle or? Luxury, which one says luxury to you? Right and left, right and left. See, I'm going to get work out with this. Um, integrity, which one shows the most integrity? The middle. Okay, let me give you a few more words. Uh, so, best commitment, innovative, trust, unique. So, the innovative was down here. Integrity, you were right, it's in the middle. Um, and the luxury was at this end. Does it give you the like brand yet? Tiffany. Of course, it's got to be Tiffany, isn't it? <laughs> Tiffany. Um, any of the others ringing a bell? No. Lufthansa. No. But similar. I understand why you like said that. This is them. So, um, so Gillette are very proud of the fact of their 100-year history. Apparently, 800 million men worldwide and a few ladies trust them with their flesh on a daily basis. Um, the thing that I have a, <clears throat> I have a difficulty uh, that throws me with them is the fact that they talk about innovative. And really, that colour to me seems much more serious. Uh, I'd, I kind of want to trust them, I want to respect them, and, and it works in that respect. So it's, for me, it's that word that really kind of throws me. With Samsung, uh, I think this blue is, is perfect. They talk about their like, mission for 2020 is to, uh, for creative partnerships, for inclusivity, um, so uh, to create the future. So they're very kind of future focused. And this blue is uh, immersive, expansive. It's almost otherworldly. The um, integrity element uh, is actually 
um, highlighted by Samsung and Tiffany, which I think is, is really interesting. I think Samsung's integrity is in their precision, also in their honesty to own up when they've messed up, i.e. like the galaxies that were blowing up. They, they fronted up to it. And um, Tiffany is one of the earliest examples of colour marketing. So they uh, first produced their... Um, their blue book over like 100 years ago. So this was their kind of catalogue. And they took the colour, uh, so, so the story goes, they took the colour um, from the gift that brides would give in the Victorian times to uh, their bridesmaids. So based on a turquoise tur uh, dove, I believe. But what I really like about this blue as well is the, the green undertone that it has gives that sense of love and softness. So I think you can see like th three blues, they're all giving you very different messages. So I think uh, we can agree that really the important thing in colour design is that uh, the colour and the design agree. So you bring everything into alignment. <clears throat> there was a study in 2014 by a um, global PR and comms company, Colin and Wolf, where they found that the number one important attribute uh, that the consumer had from a brand was honesty. So I think a few years ago, you would have heard the word authentic. Everything's authentic. But was it really? A lot of it was quite manufactured. Um, so I think it's, uh, it's, it's that element that really helps you uh, push forward. So we rarely see colours in isolation, like I just kind of showed you. Um, so I'm going to show you like a little bit of uh, one of the trend stories that we've got for 2020. So um, this will be like our top line. This is our social context, uh, context our understanding of, of position, what's happening in the world. Um, it'll show you kind of colour areas that we're looking at. Um, and their relationship to materials. But this is really kind of a starting point. So this is something that it is not specific to any industry, to any country at this point. So um, the story that I've got, I brought with you today, is OM. Uh, O-M, but it's uh, my personal sense of humour of the play on the French word for man and uh, the meditation of Om as well. Um, so basically, in the, in the, in the wake of um, the Me Too movement, there seems to have uh, developed a lot of vernacular, a lot of language around uh, men that's created a, a toxic um, sense. And um, it's interesting that, that men have been brought up with this idea of being rough, tough, superheroes had no vulnerability whatsoever but um, now we're seeing that like the the real people with courage are the ones who show integrity they show restraint um, just give you a classic example let's look at Donald Trump compared to Barack Obama uh, and you will see that absolute difference in in management um, I have a son myself. I, I don't see that uh, him and my daughter, uh, one is either better than the other. And so you, you bring them up now that, um, that men should have emotional intelligence. It's okay to feel vulnerable. And, um, and they are shaping the future of our children, our environments. Um, and this is where it's, it's all driven from. Uh, the colour areas, um, you can see that they're, they've all got kind of like a greyed, softer, softer version. Um, we're looking at areas of blue, stone materials, uh, and this um, accent of like spice red. When we start looking at materials, um, so then I won't go into the methodology too much. I think Alina's going to be talking about that later on over in the other uh, hall. Um, but we start looking at 
uh, innovators in, in design to understand how these all start to connect up. And so we can see, you know, using uh, materials like anodized aluminium, so you have that slight translucency of, um, of colour and working that kind of real precision material in with hand-woven seagrass and canes. I really love this textile in the middle that I saw um, with a designer in Milan. The complexity and sophistication of the colour mix, and then I love the fact that it's, it's all being kind of roughed up and it's a deep pile, it's soft. Um, these kind of tessellated triangulation but still expressive surface movement from Beth and Laura Woods. And then at the top, this um, I think movement is, is quite important, that's what I'm trying to get across. Uh, these facade uh, tiles inspired by the movement and the dynamism of, um, of nature. What's really interesting and uh, worth thinking about when you're presented with a trend as well is not to just look at the palette as a whole, to start looking at elements of it. So if you can see like the little slight navigation down the side, I've taken some of the colours out to kind of show how it flips. And then you'll see this other side of it works on a different aspect of it. Again, I think the translucency effect of colour is really important and reflect, reflects back to that kind of uh, confidence and vulnerability. The use of like honest materials, uh, elevating simple materials. Um, the one on the far left, I love the fact that she, um, she said sustainability comes from significance and significance comes from an emotion. So what she's saying is the value is what you place on it. And I think that's really important. Um, using kind of exposed electronics on precious materials, again, you're getting that same similar exposure, um, but confidence in functionality. And it's important not to forget that 2020 is also another Olympic year. So there will, again, through the media, we'll get a focus of uh, Tokyo, Japan. These are glass pieces for um, glass manufacturer La Suite, I think that's how you say it. Um, I'm not going to attempt to say the proper Japanese word, but basically they're, they're based on household uh, products turning into mischievous little spirits. So let's go back to our lovely uh, brands again. Here they are. So um, the brands are all going to be affected by this because this is happening socially. So they're going to have to understand it and to various extents they're going to have to deal with it. Um, but they won't all deal with it in the same way because it won't be appropriate to their product category, to their customer um, and to them, to themselves as well. So they have to be really honest in how they do it. So I've just done a really crude, really quick uh, representation of where I would see it moving from a brand perspective. None of these are my clients, so it is not, um, it, it's, it's a very quick job. So, um, on the far left, uh, Gillette, I haven't changed any of the colour, I haven't adjusted any of the nuance of the colour, but I've edited and I've looked at proportionality. So, don't imagine that this is all in one product, so even though that's a bit of a trend, so that too much. But this is kind of how it may be represented across their pro product line. In the centre, the Samsung, I've taken a lot of the black out of it. So the colours that had black within them, that's been kind of cleaned up to tie into their more technical, futurist uh, sensibilities. And then the black itself has gone a little bit more saturated just because of the... Um, the category again it's more a category uh, perspective but it's still not pure black because the um, the element doesn't doesn't work for for pure black and then for Tiffany um, you can see that I've reduced the colors probably even more um, because obviously predominantly their product is going to be silver diamond um, but this would be more around the conversation of packaging, of advertising communication. Um, 
On this one, I've just changed the purple and the blue. So the purple I've taken more to a more saturated level. It's still within the same similar uh, range as the trend target. Um, but that saturation gives you much more a sense of indulgence, of luxury, of quality. The blue, I've added more yellow to it to take it closer to their brand blue and to align that so that you get that kind of seamless transition. <coughs> One more quick drink. Ooh. This is a really quick project. Uh, a school came to me the other week. They said, we're getting a new website done. Mm, we love it. It's not quite right, though. Can't put my finger on it. So I had a look at it. And uh, really, the images are what sing. The website is all about the children. It's a school, so the images are the important thing. So the graphic designers have done exactly the right thing. They've created a very limited palette of just three colours. They've used black, a cool grey, and this kind of, I would call it like an Air force -y blue. But unfortunately, that combination, those tones, uh, completely forget about the fact that this school has won awards for colour design in its building, its architecture. Um, the colours they've used have kind of ignored their brand message, space to soar, this friendly inclusivity. So, I wanted to just give you that quick example to say, you know, not all colour design work is dramatic but it can make a dramatic difference. So all I've done is change the cool grey to a warm grey. I've taken the black to a really, really deep ocean green blue. And we've just added more yellow into this. And then all of a sudden, the uh, images start to sing. The website is a sales tool for them. And so they need to make that emotional connection with prospective parents. So these colours also relate back to the colours of the school itself. So when a, uh, when a prospective parent comes to visit, they've already got that sense of familiarity and they've got that connection. This is something that I read, uh, it was last year actually, and, and from Insights Agency, uh, the Future Laboratory. It's uh, their trend backlash culture for brand for 2020. And the part that I found really interesting was this. So it says, to not be watered down, battened down, or redefined by consumer voices. And that really resonated with me because that's exactly the way that I feel about colour design and it's the way that I've been working. And it's really what I wanted to share with you today. So successful brands continue to be successful because they're honest about who they are. They continue their brand message through every touch point. And so it becomes a, an exercise in not what colour to use, but how do you use colour? What are your parameters of colour? What types of colour are you using? And are they consistent through everything? And so that is my vision of modern storytelling through colour. Thank you very much for listening. If anybody has any questions, feel free. I've got cards and things to give out if, if anybody would like. Thank you.